once again, for those of you who don't uh, know me, I'm Nathan Johnson. You maybe recognize me from the Jigsaw Bible pamphlet that the Open Bible Trust published a, little, a few months ago, and um, that's my website. I, I put a lot of my dispensational articles uh, attached to the top, so you can see it. It's in blog format. So, like I said, you got to get used to the, the, the last article being first, because that's the way a blog works. So, uh, if you, if you want to look through my notes on Titus, you'll see chapter three first. But you just got to go to the bottom of the page. So, Titus chapter one. We start off just like we did in Ephesians with the author. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So our author, first of all, is Paul, once again. But as with all books of Scripture, of course, we understand that Paul is writing here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that the uh, there, are, there are two authors. This is Paul, but it's also God speaking through Paul. Now, Paul identifies himself. He says, Paul, a servant of God. But here our translation is a little too weak, and that is that the word there in Greek is the word for slave. That's the word doulos, and it means a slave. Now, we don't have slaves anymore in our society. We have a very dim view of slavery. We did away with it some time ago, and so we tend to look down on slavery, but we do understand that to be a slave is a very low position. And that's true. But maybe what we don't understand, what we don't get, because we don't have slavery in our society, is that the, the glory and the honor of a slave is the greatness of his master. You know, if you're the slave and you're the slave of a, a very low, very mean type of uh, master, well, then that's kind of shameful to you as a slave, that this is your master, this, this kind of low and not very honorable person. But if you are the slave of a very great master, a very high master, a very distinguished lord, well then that's, that's your honor as a slave. That's your glory, that you are the slave of this kind of master. Now when we think about it, what, what greater master could a slave have than God? To be a slave of God. That's an honorable position indeed. And Paul says that he is a slave of God. God had taken Paul as his slave. Now, I don't know that we can necessarily say that we are slaves of God. God has not taken us like he did Paul. He had, he had actually given Paul this commission, and, and Paul had to carry it out. Paul had become, in a very real way, a slave to God. God was controlling where he went and what he did. But I want us to understand that this, this is a high position. Slave is low, but a slave of God, that's a very high thing. So he is a slave of God, but then he says he's also an apostle of Jesus Christ. And apostle, our English word there, is just the, kind of the, the Greek word that turned into an English word. It's apostolos in Greek, and you just turn that into apostle. We change the Greek ending into an English ending, which is E. But uh, an apostle comes from a, a verb, apostello, which means to send, but... If you look it up in, in your lexicon, you compare it to the other word for sin, which is tempo, you see that apostello has to do with commissioning. Uh, it has to do with the, the, the one sending that more or less uh, enables you or equips you to carry out the mission they're sending you on. They're sending you with, with authority to, to do something on their behalf. So it's uh, an apostle is one who's sent with authority, who's commissioned and equipped to do the mission that they're sent on. Now, when he says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, starting off a letter, I think uh, oftentimes we think of an apostle as an office, like a pastor or something like that. Well, you could hold a, a, per, a permanent or an ongoing apostleship, but an apostleship was basically a job that you were given to do. Like I said, you were commissioned, you were sent to do something. And I believe Paul's saying he's an apostle at the start of a letter. He's saying that God has sent and commissioned him to write this letter. It's sort of a way of saying this one is inspired. I don't know that every letter that Paul ever wrote was inspired. Maybe he wrote some we don't have in the Bible that were just letters that he sent. But he starts it off saying he's an apostle. I think that's almost like saying this one was inspired. God sent me. God commissioned me with the authority to write this letter. 
So he says he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. I think that tells us that, that this letter is, he was commissioned to write by Jesus Christ. Then he says, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So he's writing for the faith of God's elect. And that is the Greek word eklektos. And it means chosen. The faith of God's chosen. Understand, when the Bible talks about being chosen, it's, it's talking about being chosen in Christ. Those of us who are in Christ are therefore chosen by God. We're chosen because we, were, we are in Christ. And we weren't. it's not necessarily that we were chosen to be in Christ in advance. Not necessarily predestination. <laughs> But it's because we are in Christ that we're chosen. And then it says, and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now, uh, the word knowledge there, knowledge is the word gnosis. And I have it spelled there on the screen, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Now, when you put epi in front of it, epi is a, a Greek prefix. You know what a prefix is. That's something you put at the front of a word. Now it's a, it's what we would call an accelerative prefix, like you say, uh, like it's a, like our English super, like you say I I have uh, abundant blessings, but if you add super on the front, you say I have super abundant blessings. Well, you just accelerated it, you you you, you just pumped it up, you just added to it when you added super on the front, and epi can do that same thing. It can accelerate it. So he's talking about the the knowledge of the truth, at least the godliness. Well, it's epinosis. That could be uh, further knowledge. Or it could be your response to the knowledge. Uh, what, you, what, what you do with the knowledge, you take the knowledge and, and you respond to it. That's why some versions translate it acknowledging. Because it's, it's taking the knowledge and, and accelerating upon it, or, or, or going beyond uh, just knowing to acknowledging. Now, it's the knowledge of the truth, he says, that leads to godliness. Now, the word they've translated leads to there is the Greek word kata, which means down. But it's a special kind of down in many cases. It's like when you go down the aisle. And when you go down an aisle, you, you go down in a certain way. If you didn't go down in a certain way, if you went down any old way, you might crash into the seats at the side of the aisle. When you go down the aisle, you have to go down the line that the seats make, down, down the aisle, down the line that is, is marked out as the aisle. And so kata means down, but down along a line, like going down an aisle. So he says, this is the truth that is down along the lines of godliness. Uh, the truth that, that is, is according to that to, to godliness, that's down along the, the lines of godliness. And the idea of godliness is of, is of right living, godly living, the way God would want you to live and behave. So, this is according to the acknowledging of the truth that is down along the lines of right living. So that's the author. Then in, in 2 through 3, we kind of have an intro. It says in verse 2, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. So he says, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. Like I said yesterday, talking about Ephesians, we hear this word hope in English, and we think about you're, you're hoping something will happen, like you buy a lottery ticket and hope you win the lottery. Well, that, that's a pretty thin hope, that's a pretty vain hope. But well, this is more along the lines of expectation, like a child who's hoping for Christmas. Well, it's going to come, but he's waiting for it, he's expecting it. So this is the, the hope, it's not, well, I hope I get eternal life, but maybe I won't. No, this is the expectation of eternal life. Anyone who's in Christ has an expectation of eternal life, not just hoping it will happen. Now, eternal there is Ionios life. And uh, comes from a Greek word ion, A I O N. And I often just English that into eon, E O N, because I think uh, our word eon came from that. It doesn't mean uh, ionios necessarily means exactly what eon means, but it's a little bit easier to say, e to say eon in English than ion. But what is this eonian life? When you think about it, our, our life now, uh, 
does not last forever. When you're a child, when you're young, your life starts out with a rush. And every year means, means a year bigger and a year stronger and a, a year better at sports and a year smarter and a year more responsibility your parents give you. And, and, and your life just seems to be building up and getting better and better. But then you get to that unfortunate age, uh, maybe around your 30s or so, where you come to the sad realization that a year older doesn't mean that anymore. Suddenly a year older means maybe another thing you can't do that you used to be able to do. Maybe a year older means another gray hair or a little bit less hair. Uh, and a year older suddenly doesn't mean a year better. And you realize that this life that started out with such a rush is now trickling out. It's trickling down. It's not going to flow on and on forever. But Eonian life is a life that flows on and on forever. It's perpetual life. It doesn't trickle out or trickle down. But another thing to understand about Eonian life is, is going with that illustration of a river. If you have a, a, a farmer who's living on a river, say an Israelite farmer, and for them you passed on the farm from generation to generation to generation, well, that river has been flowing his whole life, and his father's life, and his grandfather's life. But if you ask him, what's the most important thing about that river? He's not going to say that it's always been flowing. Yeah, that's true, of course. But to him, the importance of that river is not just that it's always flowing, but that that, that river waters his, his cattle, his animals. He uses it to irrigate his crops. He used, they used it to, to wash clothes. They drink out of it themselves. The children play on it, splash it on each other. So that river means life to them, life to that farm. So it's not just that it flows on forever, but it, it's that it, it brings life. Now I think that if I could live this life forever, I don't think that would be such a good thing. I wouldn't mind expanding my lifespan a little bit, living longer than I probably will, but I think eventually if I live long enough in this life, I just get weary with it, with all the sorrow and heartache and, and, and the sin and, and suffering in this world. I wouldn't want to live this life forever. I might like longer than I'm going to, but ultimately I think I just get tired of it. But you see, the Eonian life is a life that flows from God with every good thing that would make you want to live life forever. So again, it's not just a river that flows on forever, but it's a river that flows with every good thing from the hand of God that would make you want to live life forever. And he says that's the expectation we have. More than just life forever, but an, an Eonian life. A, a life from God that you want to live forever. Now he's <coughs> resting on the expectation of Eonian life, which God, who does not lie, of course he doesn't lie, so when he told us we're going to get this life, we can know it's true. And he says, promise before the beginning of time. Now, um, I think I have a tendency to look at the Bible a little bit scientifically because I'm trained as a scientist. Sometimes I feel like some Bible teachers look at it more philosophically because they're philosophers. But uh, I, I look at a translation like this and I say, wait a minute, before the beginning of time. Because what's the beginning of time? If you wanted to find time's beginning. Well, you know, when I look at my, at my watch, and it's a digital watch, so I can watch the seconds count 40, 41, 42. Well, every second on my watch, I know there's a second before and a second after. Every second that passes, there's a before and an after. So then what is the beginning? Well, I would say that would be the one second, the one moment, the one instant, where there was an after, but there was no before. That would be the beginning of time. So when you actually go to the beginning, there is no before. Now we know that Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And yet, John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word. God didn't come into being at the beginning. He was in the beginning. But at the same time, I don't think that that means that God was before the beginning. Because there is no such thing. The beginning, by definition, has no before. I would say that everything that exists in this universe, if there was no beginning it would never have existed, except for God. 
See, God didn't need the beginning to exist. It's not that he existed before the beginning. There is no such thing. But he didn't need the beginning to exist, like everything else in creation does. But I say there is no such thing as before the beginning of time. But you see, the, the Greek doesn't actually say this. And it doesn't say before the beginning of the world either, like, uh, like the King James has it. <coughs> what it says, it's really quite simple. It, it's three words in Greek. It says pro, which means before. They've translated that right. Then there's the word chronon. And in, in English we'd spell it with a ch, but if you've ever heard of a chronometer, what's a chronometer? Basically it's something that keeps track of time. It, you could call a clock a chronometer, it'd be kind of a fancy name, but a chrono chronometer is a meter that keeps track of time. You can talk of ordering things chronologically. And by that, you mean in the order of time. So chronon, that Greek word, means time. But then this last word, uh, it's not the word for began, but it's the word, again, eonian. It's that same word, eonian, before time, and it's times eonian. Uh, maybe I should have made that plural there, before eonian times. So what he's saying is that he promised uh, a faith and knowledge resting on the expectation of Eonian life, which God who does not lie promised before Eonian times. So I believe all he's saying here is that God promised Eonian life before Eonian times. He's promised us Eonian life before we actually get it. Basically what he's saying, not saying anything about before time began, like I said, I don't think there is such a thing. But he promised Eonian life before Eonian times. Now, verse 3, he says, And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. So at his appointed season, or, or the King James says, but has in due times. So we just talked about Eonian times, and now he talks about at, at, in, in due times, or at, at an appointed season, at a right season, he brought his word to light. And he says, that was through the preaching or the proclaiming entrusted to me. So I think what he's talking about is bringing his word to light as it was entrusted to Paul. Uh, he might, in that, be actually talking about the writing of Titus. It was due time for him to manifest the things he's about to say to Titus. Of course, that could also be true any time he gave Paul a message. But I think it's certainly appropriate here, since God is manifesting his word to Titus right now in writing this book. So at due times, he brought his word to light through the proclaiming. He says, entrusted to me. So, so this, this word that's been brought to light has actually been entrusted to Paul. Now, I would say there was, and then it was not committed to Paul by men, but by God. He says, it was entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. <clears throat> so God was the one who chose Paul for manifesting his word. Again, whether it was Titus, I suppose, or any other word, uh, book Paul wrote, or uh, even spoken word Paul gave. But the revelations he's about to bring forward in Titus were entrusted to him by the command of God our Savior. So that's the intro, and now he goes on to the recipient of the letter. Who's receiving this letter? And he says, to Titus. And that name actually means nurse. I, I don't know, I'm not going to bring any special teaching out of there, that's just what it means. It's interesting. In the Bible, sometimes the names are very significant. Sometimes you just kind of scratch your head. I don't know if this means anything. But I just thought I'd bring that one forward. So his name is Titus. Then he says, he is my true son in our common faith. <coughs> but uh, sadly, our translators have gotten it a little backwards here because this isn't the word for son. It's a Greek word, technon, which is the word for child. And like I said, I, I, I believe that son is very significant because it has to do with this idea of, of representing the father, or like the idea of a family business, where the son is the one who's going to inherit, inherit the business after the father. And it could even, it was rare in their society, but it could even, a woman could even be the son. You see that happening in the book of Numbers. Uh, kind of an odd case, but it could happen. So that we as believers are predestined to be sons, whether we're men or women, because son means more than a male child uh, in, in the biblical way of speaking. But, this is not a son, it's a child. So he says, Titus is my true child in our common faith. And I think 
there could be two things involved with that. Number one, like Mike said in his introduction, I think that that probably means that it was through Paul's proclaiming that Titus had come to faith in the first place. Titus had heard the gospel, had heard the truth about Jesus Christ through Paul. So that means he was Paul's true child in the common faith. I think there could also be some aspect in there where he says the true child, that Titus acted and imitated Paul. Remember what we saw yesterday in Ephesians 5.1, where it said, Be imitators of God like dear children. Dear children imitate their parents. Like I remember when I was a child, my dad would be mowing the lawn, my parents got me a little toy lawnmower. I would follow my dad along with that little toy lawnmower, make all the turns that he made, do the whole lawn, just walking around there with my toy lawnmower. I was imitating him like a dear child does. So he says, imitate God like dear children. Well, maybe Titus imitated Paul. I imagine he probably did. If I was around Paul, I'd probably try to imitate him. So he, he probably had come to faith through Paul, and he probably acted like, like Paul, like a child would. So then he says, grace. Again, grace. Such a huge theme in Paul. Huge theme in Paul. So he says, grace, first of all, and then peace. From God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. So peace. That's the Greek word irene, and we sometimes think of peace as just be, there's no war. Like when the war is over, you make peace. But the idea here is of more than just peace, it's of a harmonious relationship. Two nations can be at peace, not fighting each other, and yet not necessarily walking arm in arm harmonious relationship either. But the idea of peace here is a, a true union, a harmonious relationship. And so what he is wishing to Titus is grace, of course, God's grace, and then peace, which would be a true union, a harmonious relationship with God. And, wow, there isn't, there isn't much greater than that than you could wish for somebody, is there? No, he says, that is from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now it says, Christ Jesus, or, or Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, King James says, or Christ Jesus, but anyway, it says he's our Savior. But wait a minute. What did we just have in verse 3? In verse 3, we had God our Savior. Here in verse 4, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus our Savior. Now, does this mean that there are two Saviors? And you know, maybe one person goes to God to be saved, another person goes to Christ to be saved? Maybe one day I'm saved by God, the next day saved by Jesus Christ? Well, no, of course not. There is only one Savior. Isaiah says that clearly. He says, I alone am the Savior. There is no other Savior. There can only be one Savior. So if God is our Savior and Jesus Christ is our Savior, what does that mean? That means that God and Jesus Christ are one. And they're the same. And we know that that's true. Um, so God the Father is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And sometimes you'll find that that word and there. Uh, in Greek, it's the word chi, and sometimes that's used um, between two names that are the same thing. Like when it says, God, even the Father. They've actually translated that same word even there rather than and. Because uh, you wouldn't be talking about God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, like they're different. So sometimes that word can mean even, and it means that they're the same thing. And we know Christ said, I and my Father are one. So in a way, they are the same. Now we know some ways you look at them and they're different. Some ways you look at them and they're, they're the same. That's, that's kind of the mystery of the Godhead. It's hard for us to understand, hard for us to grasp. But, yes, God and Christ, they're the same. Now, on to verses 5 through 6. Paul starts talking about elders. And um, he says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. <laughs> so apparently after, as Mike already talked about in his intro, after Acts 20 and 31, Paul's two years in Rome, he apparently left there, traveled around again, and one of the places that he visited was Crete. Now, Crete he apparently had, had not been to uh, before during the book of Acts. I don't know why, but... Perhaps, when Paul says in Romans 15, that he strove to go places where Christ had not been named, had not been proclaimed yet. And we know from Acts 2.11 that some of the Jews who were there at Pentecost were Cretans. So 
So maybe these Cretans who were there at Pentecost had gone back to Crete and had proclaimed the gospel there. And so therefore there were believers in Crete. So probably there were already Cretan believers, so Paul, striving to go where Christ hadn't been named, hadn't gone to Crete during Acts. But like he says in Romans, he covered all those places. So then he says, now I'm free to come to you in Rome. And so he was, he was probably free to go to Crete too now, and he goes there at this point. But he finds, apparently, some things unfinished in Crete. Some things that, that needed to be set in order that, that maybe weren't exactly what they were supposed to be. And so Paul can't stay in Crete maybe as long as he'd like, so he leaves Titus there to set things in order, to finish up the things that Paul didn't get to finish. And then he says, to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Crete was an island, not a town. So there were multiple towns on, on the island of Crete. And so he says, in every town I want you to appoint elders. Now an elder, that's the Greek word presbyteros. And the Christian group called the Presbyterians gets their name from this word. But the idea of, of elder, again, we think of an elder as an office. And it was that in a way, but it was an office based, again, on a job. It was a job you did. In a lot of ways, the elder was a representative of the community, as well as a leader. He was the leader and the re within the community, and he was the representative outside the community. So there's kind of two sides of the coin. Among them, he's the leader. Outside of them, he's the representative. Now, verse 6, he says, An elder must be blameless. The husband of but one wife... A man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being <coughs> wild and disobedient. Now I think he, he says these elders have to have qualifications. And I think that's because an elder, as a leader and as a representative of the community, he's going to be kind of the one you're putting on a pedestal. And you're saying to the other believers, this is your standard of what you want to be like. And you want to be like that elder. You want to copy his behavior and you want, you want to try to make your life like him. And therefore, he says, the elder must not be blameless. Now, we know that ultimately no one is sinless. So by this, he, he can't mean sinless. And I mentioned, of course, Romans 3, verse 10, says there is none righteous, no, not one. So, of course, he doesn't mean sinless by blameless. So I think what he probably means is blameless in the things he's about to list. Blameless in the things he's about to list. So in what ways does he want him to be blameless? He says he wants him to be the husband of but one wife. Now, in Greek, this literally means, reads a one-woman man. Now, there were places, and there are still places today, where polygamy happens. And it can be very difficult. And of course, this is hard if someone comes to Christ, and they're already not a one-woman man. And that can be a difficult situation. Because in a lot of poor cultures, poor societies, if that man says, I'm a Christian now, I've got to kick out all my wives but one, well, they'd be out on the street, maybe they'd starve to death. So when you enter a situation, it's already messed up. Uh, you can't just do a bunch of uh, ungracious and, and terrible things to, to try to get everything back perfect the way it should be again. Maybe that man has to stay as a polygamist so his wives won't be on the street. But what is he going to do with his sons? He should teach them to be believers and then tell them, you should only have one wife. That's what God wants. So if you start out in a messed up situation, you don't just hack and slash to fix everything. But you say, what's the ideal I'm going to uphold? Okay, I'm not at the ideal now, but, but this is the ideal. And so what Paul's saying is that these representatives, you want to strive to have representatives, elders, leaders, who, who actually achieve the ideal. And maybe this means some people can't be elders, therefore. Well, that's fine. You know, it doesn't mean you're not a believer, not in Christ, not forgiven. But it's just you're not the, you're not the example of what you want to hold up on the pedestal. Now, it actually doesn't just say husband of one wife, like I said, but a one-woman man. And that is really the standard. And like I said, it doesn't have to be just polygamy. But, you know, a man who has a, a child by an ex-girlfriend over here and... Uh, wife he's divorced from, he has a couple children over there, and then his current wife. Well, he, he's not a one-woman man. If he wants to see his one child, he's got to go to one woman, and other children go to another woman. He's not a one-woman man. Now, again, there, there's forgiveness. It's not like he can't be a believer or anything. But this isn't the ideal. The ideal is the one-woman man. 
If you don't match the ideal, well, there's forgiveness. But that's what you want to uphold. That's what you want to put on the pedestal, is the one woman man. Then he says, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So what's the ideal? And you say, well, you can't necessarily even help it if your children believe. Well, no. You can bring up in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord, so of course there is some responsibility on the parents. But we know that everybody has to make their own decision. But again, remember, this is about the ideal. What are you going to put on the pedestal? Well, what's on the pedestal, what you want everybody to strive to be like, is to have believing children. Well, of course, that almost seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> Who wouldn't want their children to believe? I think he's saying this is the, what you want to put on the pedestal, one with believing children. And then children who are not open to the charge are being wild and disobedient. Now, again, we say, well, in some ways, isn't that a little bit unfair? Because in some ways, that's partly the parents and partly the children, too. Well, yes, but again, we're talking about the ideal. We're talking about the standard. What you want to hold up on the pedestal is obedient children. Now, verse 7, he says, Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless. So now we're going on to overseers. He must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. So what is this matter of the overseer? Well, this is another Greek word. This is a Greek word, episkopos. And you recognize that, that epi, like I said, that can, that can be accelerative. It, it accelerates things. Um, but it, it also literally it means a pond or, uh, or, or over. Uh, it's the idea of above. And scopos. Well, you maybe recognize that from microscope. That's something that you can look at things that are really small. Telescope. You can look at things that are far away. So scope, uh, maybe you talk about scope something out. Right? It means to look. To look at something. So episcope, it would be like an overlooker. Well, we can't really translate it that, right? Because over, to overlook something in English, well, it has a specific meaning, and I don't think that's what this means. Some people translate it overseer. Well, again, in English, we almost have this idea of somebody cracking the whip when you're talking about an overseer. Somebody who's making people toe the line. Uh, almost a slave master idea, an overseer. So I think the best way to put this in modern English is an overwatcher. Because I think the idea of an episcopos is one who watches over his fellow believers for their own good. So in other words, you're watching maybe, maybe young believers that you know, and you see and maybe they're having struggles in, in their marriage, or, or maybe they're having difficulties with their children, and you, you kind of come alongside them and you say, you know, look, I, I notice you're having some problems. I, I would like to be able to help you and, and, and maybe give you advice and share with you the wisdom that I have. You see, what's that person doing? He's acting like an overwatcher to his fellow believers. He's watching over them for their good. He is, he is keeping a watch out for them. He, he's doing that to help them. See, that's the idea of an overwatcher, an, epis, an episcopos, is that he watches over his fellow believers. So, yeah, in a way, he's, he's choosing people to be this. It's, it's kind of an office. But the office is based on a job. Job being done for fellow believers. It's not just, not just the title you can put behind your name. If you're not acting like an overwatcher, you aren't an overwatcher whether you have the title or not. An overwatcher needs to watch over his fellow believers. And we can be that for other believers, whether we get, get a title or, or not. But what does he say an, an episcopos, an overwatcher, needs to be like? He says, since an overseer and an overwatcher is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless. Again, sinless? No. Blameless in the things he's about to list. He says, not overbearing. I mean, it, he, he's, he's going to come alongside people to help them, but then he's overbearing and saying, no, you have to do this. No, no, no. He's doing that to help and encourage, not to be the boss. He must not overbearing, not quick-tempered. So if he's going to get angry at people instead of helping them, it's not a good idea for him to be an overwatcher. Not given to drunkenness. You wouldn't want somebody drunk trying to come up to you and be an overwatcher. 
Now, the word there in Greek is uh, literally par oinos, and it means beside wine. Somebody was always beside wine. Now, um, what would that look like? Well, I remember I was over at some friend's house once, and they were showing me pictures of their son and daughter-in-law. I noticed there was a series of pictures, and every one of these pictures, their daughter-in-law was holding a can of beer. I thought, wow, that doesn't seem like a good sign. Now, I don't know, maybe that was a little unfair. Maybe it was just, just one day and she was drinking one beer and they took a bunch of pictures in a, in a row. But it looked to me like, wow, is this somebody who's, who's always beside wine? He says, that's, that's just not a good thing for an overwatch or someone who, who just always seems to have alcohol in their hand. That's someone who's, who's just beside wine. They live their life alongside it. Not good. You don't want an overwatcher to be that way. Then he says, not violent. Well, certainly you wouldn't want an overwatcher to be that. Not pursuing dishonest gain. Yeah, I want to help you. Um, can you give me a little money? No, you don't want an overwatcher to be that way. Somebody who is, who is going to try to get money out of their overwatching relationship. He says, rather he must be hospitable. Now there could be two sides to this. One would be, what well, we think of hospitality, taking other people into his home, being hospitable. Of course that would be good. There also can be the other side, knowing how to take hospitality. And sometimes that's important too. You don't want to just presume on people to be hospitable. You don't want to just be uh, expecting people to take you into their homes and almost forcing them to do it, taking advantage of their openness or anything like that. No, you need to know how to to be hospitable and how to take hospita hospitality yourself as an overwatcher. And he says, needs to be one who loves what is good. Of course, if you're overwatching other people, you need to love what's good and want what's good in their lives, too. Must be self-controlled, of course, upright, holy, set apart to God, and disciplined. You need to have all these characteristics in your own life if you're going to help other people with their lives. Well, I, I think that's a little bit convicting. None of us maybe lives up to all these standards 100%. He says, this, this, this sort of person, you know, maybe they're not perfect, maybe they don't do this perfectly all the time, but just general character, you want it to be this way if they're going to be watching over other people. Then verse 9, he says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy messages it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So he says, so he can encourage, or uh, I guess the translation I used uh, earlier was exhort, he can encourage others. And the, that's the Greek word parakaleo. Again, it, it means beside, par means beside, and a parakaleo, uh, there's an odd, unusual English word paraclete that we get from the French, it really comes from this parakaleo. It's, it's almost like a, a defense lawyer, it's someone who comes alongside you to help you in your time of need. Well, of course, that's what an overwatcher is all about. But he is able to, to come alongside, to be positioned alongside, to help others by sound doctrine, by sound teaching. And then he says that he may be able to refute. Now, that's the Greek word elencho. It's spelled with a G, but in, in Greek you just can't say G-C-H, so you make it N-C-H. Elencho. And that means to make the facts known. <coughs> So he can, he can encourage others, come alongside and help them. He can, by sound doctrine, he can make the facts known to those who oppose sound doctrine. And oppose there in Greek is anti-lego. Now in English we think of anti as meaning against. I'm anti this, I'm against it. But the Greek idea of anti is instead. And lego means speaking. So this literally means so that he can make the facts known to those who speak something instead of sound doctrine. Now, if you're speaking something that's not sound doctrine, of course, you're speaking something that's instead of sound doctrine. So he says, this overwatcher, he needs to be able to give sound doctrine, make the facts known regarding sound doctrine to those who are saying something instead of sound doctrine, instead of good teaching. Now, Titus 1, 10 through 11, he talks about the rebellious. He says, for there are many rebellious pe people mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. So he says, there are many rebellious people, there are mere talkers or, or senseless talkers, 
And then deceivers, literally in Greek, that's mind deceivers. They're deceiving people's minds. And he says, especially those of the circumcision group. Now, uh, I have down in my notes there, and, and interestingly, we, we've talked about that yesterday in some detail. That circumcision was done away with in Colossians 2.11. Now, we have the circumcision not made with hands. And so circumcision is a physical right is done away with. And in Philippians 3, 2 through 3, it gives kind of God's new attitude toward it, which is, Paul speaks very negatively of it there, and, and says some very hard things about those who are teaching circumcision. Now, Paul's contention with those who insisted on circumcision for salvation has, has been going on for a long time, uh, since Acts 15, 1. But of course, since the dispensational change, uh, circumcision isn't right for Jews either. It's been done away with completely. So... He says, especially those of the circumcision group are, are rebellious. So verse 11, he says, They must be silenced, because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. So he says, they must be silenced. And, and to put it not quite delicately, he'd be saying uh, in the modern colloquial phrase, these people need to shut up. Uh, so they must be silenced. Why? He says, because they are ruining whole households. Uh, they're ruining whole families, whole households of people by their teaching. And he says, they're teaching things they ought not to teach, you know, especially the circumcision stuff. And what was this about? This was about adding rituals to faith in Christ. <coughs> and, and faith in Christ, we, we don't have rituals to add to that. Our faith in Christ is sufficient. We are complete in Him, as Colossians 2 says. We are made complete in Jesus Christ just by our faith in Him. And we, any time you add rituals to that and say you're not complete in Christ until you do this ritual, well, he says that that subverts <coughs> households, teaching things you ought not, and he says, why are they teaching it? It's for dishonest gain. They're teaching us to make money out of it. Many of these people, they know how to circumcise. Uh, they've got the knives, they know the proper procedure. And so they say, you need to be circumcised, now circumcise your children for a fee. So they're actually teaching false things to get money. They're teaching false things for monetary gain. So that, I think that is why Paul is particularly angry, is they're not just doing it because they honestly believe it, they're doing it because they can make money off of it. But again, like I said, some people who teach rituals, it is for that reason, because they make money off of it. But our completeness is in Christ. And he says, even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. So he says, even one of their own prophets. Now this was not one of God's prophets, this was one of the Cretans' prophets. Uh, in other words, he, he spoke, he kind of spoke for the Cretans, just like a prophet speaks for God, Cretans' prophet speaks for the Cretans. Uh, we can't say uh, for sure who this was, but it seems to be a guy named Epimenides who was a, a Cretan, who, who said this. He was a philosopher and apparently made this statement. Now he was proclaiming the character of men in Crete. Now understand that back then, cities were kind of city-states uh, in many places. They were their own little world. And you can see, especially on, the, on an island like Crete, uh, maybe, maybe not the each individual city on Crete, but the island itself would be its own little world. It would be like the Milwaukee area had its own culture, its own customs, uh, its own characteristics that all the people had, and, and maybe Chicago was, was completely different, Minneapolis was completely different, and, and so forth. It's because, in many ways, they were so isolated. Our society, we mix a lot more. They were so isolated that individual cities, and certainly a place like an island, would have its own character, its own culture. You'd just expect the people from there to act a certain way. And so uh, Crete was kind of its own little world, and so its people all seemed to have taken on certain characteristics. And unfortunately, there were some very, very negative aspects of that, those characteristics, and that was that they were, he says, they're liars. These Cretans are always lying. That was just uh, almost their, their cultural thing. They would lie. <coughs> then he says, secondly, they are troublesome beasts. Boy, that's... That's pretty harsh words, but he says, you know, their own, their own prophet said this of them. And then he says, they're, they're lazy gluttons. Now, um, 
Interesting, or, or uh, slow bellies, it says in English. And interestingly, that word bellies is often translated womb in a lot of cases. So, I don't know, lazy from the womb? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's, it's more the idea of, of lazy in their, in their internals. You know, like, uh, like the, the womb is the internals, the child's in the internals. These people, uh, right down in their, in their belly, in the internal part of them, they're lazy. Lazy to the core is maybe how we put it in English. So um, this was, um, I think, what, what Paul talked about as a, as a polytuma, a conversation, a manner of life. Their manner of life in Crete was this way. Now he says that uh, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. So he says, this is one of their prophets, he wasn't speaking for God, but he spoke correctly. He summed his own people up well, that, that they are this way. And so he says, therefore you need to rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. Now again, that's the word elangcho. Spell with a G, pronounce with an N. Elangcho, make the facts known to them and do it sharply. Do it bluntly. Just straight out tell them, don't be lying like that. Don't be so lazy. And just, just bluntly, straight out, sharply make the facts known to these people because they need that. So, what's the characteristics in our own culture, maybe we can ask ourselves, that aren't so good, that we might have picked up on, that maybe we need to be reminded of sharply? Certainly something to think about. Titus 1, 14 through 16, he talks about these people being disapproved. He says, he says, they will, so make the, rebuke them sharply so they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. So he says, Jewish myths. So these are just made up stories and made up commandments of men. And certainly made up stories. In this case, it was made up stories by the Jews. And uh, you want to see some of those, look at the Apocrypha. I think you'll find some made up stories of the Jews. Some of the Apocrypha is very good. Some of them are maybe a little bit of Jewish myth there. But made up stories, Jewish made up stories, and then commands that are just made up by men. He says, these types of things turn people away from the truth. And I think there are these types of things who go, that go around in Christianity too, made up stories that, that you hear all the time. Uh, stories that, that aren't really true. People who go around saying, I raised somebody from the dead in such and such a place. Well, I don't think the person actually did. He made that up. And commandments of men, commandments men have just made up with. And you can't do this. You can't go here. You can't wear this. Just commandments men made up. He says this sort of thing turns people away from the truth. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. Now, if these people were teaching circumcision, they were probably also teaching clean and unclean laws for food. I don't know that that's the only thing that Paul means here, but certainly this could apply. Because according to 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 5, we know that all food is clean for us today. Clean and unclean laws don't apply to us. Yet Paul says, to the pure, everything is pure. He says, to those who are corrupted and do not believe. If you're not believing what God revealed in 1 Timothy, that, that all foods are now clean. He says, to them nothing is pure. He says, if you refuse to believe God that all foods are clean, and you're just eating the clean foods and you think you're good, he says, no. Because you don't believe, God doesn't count any of your food being clean. If you believe God, counted all your food being clean, then it would be all clean. The fact that you don't believe him and you're only eating clean foods, that means God doesn't consider any of your food clean. Because you're unbelieving. He says, your mind and your conscience is corrupted because you won't believe God. Verse 16, he says, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So he actually says that these people claim to know God. Maybe many of them did, or some of them did anyway. But because they were, they were adding these rituals to salvation, he says, by their actions they're actually denying God. Because they're denying his truth. And you don't add rituals to salvation. <coughs> he says, because of this they become detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. He says, because they add rituals to salvation, actually anything that they do that otherwise might be good is no longer even good. Just like food that would otherwise be clean is no longer even clean. There's things that they do 
that otherwise might be good in God's sight, they can't even be good anymore. Because of, of they're, they're adding things to salvation. Uh, these good works that they're adding to salvation, even if they were good otherwise, they aren't good anymore because they're binding them on people. They're adding them to salvation. So this is very, very important, Paul says, not to add things, not to add rituals to salvation like these circumcisers are doing. Well, that's the close of Titus 1. Do we have any questions or uh, 